strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, finding me and all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. There's two of them on there. Uh, oh, them he can, on there. He can. Have you figured out where they're all at now? Huh? Have you figured out where all the all the slides are at? All the lies? slides. Slides. Have you figured out the the sequence of the slides yet? <laughs> no. <I haven't. laughs> Y'all have to show me. There's my map. I'll only go to. That one? Yeah. Okay. That's my favorite map. Number 363. 363. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The lily of the valley. In him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He all my griefs has taken, and all my sorrows borne, 
and temptation is my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken, and all my idols scorn, and my heart in now he keeps me by his power. Will all the world forsake me, and Satan tempt me sore? Through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here, while I live by faith and do His blessed will. I'll wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With this manna he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall never roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. I'd like to know who wrote that. Because they didn't have a name up there in the left hand corner and it says English Melody up on the right. It always right reminds me of Spade Cooley. We'll look, we'll look into that. Okay. <laughs> All right. It reminds me of Spade Cooley. He's a old country uh, western singer fiddle going like that all right now i'm going to read to you some of our emails that we get from around the country and around the world as john cameron swayze used to say i can't get john cameron swayze out of my mind y'all don't know john cameron swayze do you do you remember him i remember a little bit he was the top news reporter in 1956 when I was in high school. He was like Tom Brokaw and uh, and all those guys put together. Of course, it was all black and white, and it wasn't, he'd say, from around the world. And brought to you by Timex, which takes a licking and keeps on ticking. <laughs> that was the saying on there. I remember... Winston tastes good like a cigarette should. <laughs> and that's back when they advertised cigarettes and they don't do that anymore because they give you cancer. They even had doctors. Huh? They even had doctors promoting it. Yeah. <laughs> and all the old movie stars, they all light one cigarette after another. They thought they were cool. And they're all dying at 58 and 59 years old of cancer. Hey, it was something else. All right. I'm going to read some of these emails. They come from everywhere. Got one from Costa Rica today and up in Illinois. Sometimes we have a lot of them, and other times we don't. But uh, got an email from Chris Snyder in Florida. He moved up here with us for a while, and he... He loved the truth, and uh, he, he was young. It's hard to stay away from home when you're young. He was, what, 22, 23, and, and uh, probably got homesick. Chris, we love you. Home is, home is supposed to be where the heart is, but evidently your heart, your heart was down in Florida. <laughs> but he writes an email to us. Hey, Pastor. Hey, Chris. I have a question for you. I want to make sure I'm on target with this since I do still consider you a mentor since you have a ton of information. I appreciate that. Also, what does not seek with her own mean? Well, it means you don't seek yourself. Let every man seek another's wealth and not his own wealth, Paul said. Look out for others and not yourself. Boy, that is a hard lesson to learn. Because we all want to make sure we have the right job, we have the right uh, 
we have the right girlfriend so we can have the right wife and get the right bills and the right house and the right career and that's I was checking through a checkout counter today and I said I don't want to be young anymore but I want a young body but I asked the pharmacist I said you got anything back there that can make me young but I can keep the same brain I got he said no I don't think so I'd rather have the brain I've got in the old body. Because being young is frustrating, isn't it? Absolutely. And in fact, the lady that was checking us out, she's probably in her 50s. She said, I don't want to be young either. Anyway, he says, and he's question. he's got a question about 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. Charity suffereth long and it is kind. Charity envieth not, vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. <clears throat> Let me read it from the Bible, okay? Charity suffereth long. The word is macrothemia. Macro. Long, it's the same basic word as long suffering, macro. Thumia, T H U M I A. Macrothemia comes from macros and thumos. Thumos, you remember, that's a word that means to breathe hard. Breathe hard. It takes a long time when you're a believer to get to breathing hard after anything. It's You put up with things a long time. I start to say before you lose it, but you try not to lose it. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Crestatos. C-H-R-E-S-T-A-T-O-S. Crestatos comes from several words. And it usually finally aligns with Kriya. Kriya which is the word anoint, and we're anointed with truth. Kind is not the word nice. Kind means to meet a need. Well, what people need is the truth. They don't need flattery and to make people feel good. That's not what they need. Suffereth long and is kind and does not vaunt itself and is not puffed up. I always think of puffed up from 1 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, where the Bible says, in the 8th chapter, it says here that as touching things offered to idols, we know that knowledge puffs up. That word puffs up is basically the same word, fusiao, P-H-U-S-I-O-O, P-H-U-S-I-O-O. It means to be conceited and have your attention on yourself. That's in, Charity is not puffed up. It's not conceited. It thinks of others and not self. Do you know all these these things here in the 13th chapter means it's crucifying self and looking to others, not self. And then it says uh, that not behave itself unseemly. That reminds me of Ephesians, the 5th chapter. Where the, we'll look over there real quick. That reminds me of Ephesians, the 5th chapter, Galatians, Ephesians. And you can read the first part of this chapter. Be followers of God, dear children. Walk in love, in agape. Walk in God's commandments. As Christ hath loved us and hath given himself for... Uh, given himself for us an offering, a sacrifice for a sweet-smelling savor, but fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness let it not be once named among you, neither filthiness, ice, 
quios means shamefulness, nor foolish talking. We don't need to be talking foolishly. Uh, it means to be joking about the Word of God, not jesting, which is not convenient to the Word of God. That's more or less what he's saying over here when he's saying, does not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. It seeks another man's wealth and how he's doing. You know, when you learn to think of others, that's where the fullness of life is. It's not thinking about number one. That's not it. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, doesn't think of wickedness about other people. You got, boy, do you realize thinking no evil, you got to get a hold of your mind to think no evil. Rejoiceth not with iniquity. Now that's a very interesting word. Anomia is the word iniquity. Anomia comes from the word nomas and the alpha privative. Nomos is the Greek word law or legally prescribed food for animals. And we're sheep. Anomia would mean no lawful food. No partaking of the world's food. It always reminds me of the tree in the garden. Don't eat of that tree. That's iniquity. Rejoiceth in truth. Aletheia. Pulling the cover off. Beareth all things of God. Anything that God puts upon you, you bear it. Believeth all things of God that he does. Even the evil. You believe it comes from God. Hopeth all things. Hope, remember, is the word elpizo. means to depend on the promises of God. E-L-P-I-Z-O. Depend on the promises that God has made. Hope with all things doesn't mean I hope I get a new car. That's not what it means. Endureth all things. Charity never faileth. Charity is the word agape. It never fails. That's walking in the commandments of God. And I could read on here, but I won't. So, he goes on to say in verse 7, uh, is everything that has to do with instruction in this book. You walk in front of your enemies in this fashion. Second John 1 and 6, kind assisting someone in distress. Kindness. Here's an allegory. If Buddhist murderer was unrepentant, would you feed him? I would feed anybody that's hungry. Anybody. And then I would give him a DVD and say, watch this. And if it doesn't change your life and you don't care about it, I won't give you anything else. I've done that with people. I pulled up to over at uh, Hundred Oaks. I was leaving Hundred Oaks one day, 15 years ago probably. Pulled up to the light and there was a Wendy's right here and there was a guy out there that had a sign that said, I'm hungry. I said, I've got to go help him. He didn't say, I've got a bunch of kids. or He just said, I'm hungry. I stopped and pulled in over there. And, and I said, come on, let's go inside. I said, would you like a cheeseburger? He said, yeah, that'll be enough. I said, let's get some fries with that, okay? And then he said, all right. I said, how about an apple pie? He said, I don't need that. I said, get an apple pie anyway. Give him an apple pie. And I said, all I want you to do when you get a chance, listen to this cassette. That's all I want in return. He said, I'll do that, I promise. I never heard from him again. But I don't know what God did with him or that cassette. Anyway... If a Buddhist murderer served his time and was repentant as, and he was in distress, you would feed him. Absolutely. 
if he's hungry. I'll always feed anybody. If thine enemy hunger, feed him. If you thirst, give him to give him to drink. This is the twelfth chapter of Romans. For in so doing, you'll heap coals of fire upon his head. But you won't embrace him. Well, I'll talk to him about truth. And if he doesn't want it also, well, that's all you get from me. Because of the contrary in beliefs. Correct? You can feed anybody that's hungry. I don't believe in letting people go hungry if they are. But I don't, by the same token, I don't believe in sending money to these overseas things about these feeding the children or something like that. Because you remember the guy that was who had the feeding the children thing. He was buying big houses out in Los Angeles and Cadillacs. And what was his name? Larry Jones, yeah. He's spending all that money on his family. I don't believe in that. I read a lot of articles. Only about 11 cents out of every dollar you to give to one of those organizations get to where it's supposed to go. If I know them and where to send it all, then it's sent directly to them. That's why we send money to the needy out here. Vincent in Illinois writes, Enjoy watching your method of teaching the Holy Scriptures. As it gets closer to the end of the, this era, the relevance of what you are teaching skyrockets. Well, I hope so. Could you please send me a DVD on the inner and the outer man? Yeah, we will do that. And all your info you have on the bl blood of Christ baptisms. Well, we got a bunch of DVDs on that. And he sends his address. Thank you, Vincent in Illinois. Vincent, keep writing to us. If you're really hungry for the truth, I keep telling people that call me on the phone, I love this truth you teach. I say, well, if you really love it and you're seeking truth, Jesus said, my brothers and sisters, those old that do the will of the Father, I'll tell them that makes you my brother. And they will just tickle to death when I say that to them. But that's the truth. We love you, Vincent. Keep writing. Steve Drum in San Pedro, Costa Rica. Greetings to my fellow elect sheep at Grace and Truth Ministries. He writes often. In Luke 9, 59, 60, when a new recruit of Jesus asked him if he could first bury his own father, who had just died. No, he hadn't just died. He said, let me go bury my father before I follow you. And Jesus, Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead. What he wanted to do is stay at home till his father died. That's what he wanted to do. Jesus responded by saying, let the dead bury their dead, but go and preach the kingdom of God. My question is, did Jesus say that this is this to the guy because he was elect? That's the only people he... Jesus knew who the elect were. He didn't go to the non-elect and say, follow me. When he said, follow me to Matthew, he was one of God's family. He would never... When people say, but he ate with sin sinners, with publicans and sinners... Well, he knew which publicans were believers. Publican was a, was a low-down person. A publican was a man in Israel that was represented the Roman government. And the Romans said, you can be our tax gatherer. That's what a publican was. And you can put whatever money you want on the top of that. And that's what you'll get. But they'll have to pay it. And Israel hated publicans. They said it was nothing lower than a publican because they were tacking big mounts on the top of it. And was not... My question is, did Jesus say this guy to this guy because he was elect? Always. Jesus always talked. He went straight to the elect. See the difference between him and us. He knows who they are. We don't. So I preached to everybody. And his father was not non-elect. 
Or was he merely stating that in general those who are dead in sin? No, he only went to the elect. When he went to the Pharisees who were not elect of God, he called them generation of vipers, snakes, your father's the devil. He didn't try to convert them. Which could either mean they're unregenerate or the non-elect. He never went to the non-elect. When he did, he called them down. Are the ones whose job is to take care of the dead. No, he was saying, let the man die and let the people take care of him. You come follow me. Please clarify what exactly Jesus meant in this verse. That's what he meant, Steve. We love you, Steve. Keep writing. And then Rob in Jacksonville, Florida. Hello, Jim. Hey, Rob. Would you share some wisdom on a couple of questions about Satan? Was doing a study and I saw where Satan entered Judas and wondered if it was literal or figurative just as in an adversary. Remember, adversary, the word Satan is just the word Satan in the Greek. I mean the Hebrew, Satan. It's the word Satanas, S-A-T-A-N-A-S. And it means adversary. An adversary, I believe Satan is in our flesh. I don't believe Satan is hovering around in the air waiting to enter into somebody. I believe this is it right here. If there was a Satan hovering around in the air, your your heart's more wicked than that. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That's what the heart is. And Jesus said, a demon was self. Then entered Satan into Judas Iscariot. You know, I believe went into him pride and self. That's just like an evil spirit from God entered into Saul and wanted to kill David. Second question. Some folks seem to think that Satan is not a real being. He just represents our flesh in opposition to God. That's more or less what I believe. I don't believe he's some... I've never seen a demon. Have you seen one? No. I've seen some men that were demons. I've known some that were wicked to the core. What would you say to someone who doesn't believe Satan is a real being? I don't know what he is. You're trying to explain something that I don't believe anybody can explain. But I believe it's in our flesh, without a doubt. Thank you again for all you do. Much agape. Rob in Jacksonville, Florida. Then I've got some YouTube comments. Jesus is the Messiah, is this man's name. He commented on the doctrine, instruction of grace and truth ministries, how to witness. Jim, how can people be in the faith and then run after doctrines of devils oh that's real simple to answer you've got an inner and an outer man the outer man serves the law of the flesh or self inner man is Christ in you serves the law of God Romans seven twenty five says so if they're saved from the beginning well it's the inner man they're not saved from the beginning God has picked them out to be saved from the beginning of the world. Please help me understand this. Watch the the DVDs on the inner and the outer man. The Bible says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. That's the outer man. And whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. That's the inner man. And God will work on that outer man for 50, 60, 70 years until you and I learn to give him up. We won't give him up completely, but we'll realize the ramifications involved in following self. I know I do. We love you, Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah. John Hall commented on the traditions of the Pharisees that lead into captivity, water baptism, and circumcision, are no more. Hey, Jim, can you please 
Break down the original language in Acts 10, 47 to show us how you got not the water forbid. Well, you look up the word forbid. You look up the word forbid in a Strong's Concordance. And then you take, then you take an interlinear Bible, get the exact spelling on it. Get the exact spelling in an interlinear Bible in that verse. Write it down. And then take, take an analytical lexicon. You have to learn your Greek alphabet and look it up alphabetically in here. And it will say I-N-F. It'll say forbid. I-N-F. That means it's an infinitive it's a verbal noun, verbal noun, or we know it as an infinitive. So it actually says not the water forbid. It actually is like saying no more Water baptism. Build a dam there and stop it. No more. And he's talking about it, the house of Cornelius because before Jesus was crucified, they would have had to have washed a man, circumcised him, washed him in water, and offered two turtle doves. All of that has been canceled, Colossians 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of rituals. That's where it comes from. But you've got to learn your alphabet. It's not hard. It's easy. Instead of A, B, C, D, you have A, B, G, D. You've got to learn to look at the letters and tell what they are. There's no C's in the Greek alphabet. And then you have E, Z, E, Epsilon, Zeta. The Zeta is here and not at the end of the alphabet because they were here before we were and they can do it their way. So they're the ones that put the Z there. And then they have an Eta. This is a short E like Met. This is a long E like They. This is an Eta. And you have a T-H, T-H-L-I-B-O. Narrow is the way. This is a T-H. That's one letter in the, in the Greek alphabet. And then you have, this is, then you have our, our alphabet, I. No J, forget J. I-K-L. L looks like an upside down Y. L. M, N, an M looks like an upside down H, an N looks like a V, and then you have an, an X. This is called a Kz. That's an X there. X, E, N, O, S, Kzenos. Think it not strange concerning the fire trial which is to try you. X, O, O looks like an O. You got two O's. You got a short O and a long O. This is this long O is pronounced O. This one is pronounced Ah, like a not, not. O P. That looks like a pie, and it is. You join Sigma Pi in the college. Pi. P. No Q. Forget Q. That it's not there. R S T. An R is like it's like our R with the front leg knocked off. S, this is S in the middle of the word. I should have had S on the end of the word, looks like our S. Then T U and a P H P H I L E O. That's one letter in the Greek. Phi. Key. This is not an X. That's a that's a key. X. Or that's the key, C-H, 
R-I-S-T-O-S. That's a C-H. That's a key. You go to Joy Sigma Chi or Sigma Key. And this is a P-S. P-S. U-C-H-I-K-O-S. Sukikos is the word natural. P-S and then an omega. you got to learn that before you can look these things up in an analytical lexicon. It's not hard. It's basically our alphabet. All right. Then I got another fellow that writes, and he says, didn't put a name there. Goya uh, commented, Maybe it's a takeoff on goyim, which is the word Gentile in the Hebrew, or goy. Sons of God marry the daughters of men. Explained, angels do not sleep with women. Jim, perhaps this is somewhat irrelevant question, but regarding angels being messengers, do angels always deliver someone else's message, or would God? Jesus was called an angel in in Joshua, the fifth chapter. Angel means a messenger. Gabriel can be a messenger. He's an angel. And and you got... He was a messenger of good tidings. Michael was a death angel. He killed 185,000 people and men in one night. That's as tough as you can get. Who delivers his own message also considered an angel? Would Satan be considered an angel? Yes, he would because he was a fallen angel. And he, an angel can be good or bad news. That's why they had good demons and bad demons. Because demon and, and God were interchangeable in the ancient world. Because they considered their ancestors demons. Fine liars always, we, Goya keep writing to us. Fine liars always commented on mark, name, character, behavior of the beast. Genesis 3, Genesis 7, Revelation 13. And then their comment is, MacArthur dances around divorce because of what he did to Eileen Gray. I don't remember Eileen Gray. So evidently he had something in with her. Absolutely disgusting behavior from MacArthur. Well, he says some disgusting things. I've I've cared about John for a long time. I was a follower of John MacArthur in the early eighties. I used to get his I used to get his cassettes. And I kept listening to him and I heard things that I just did not agree with. I believe John is a believer, but he is compromising because he needs to keep that crowd there. He gets 10,000 people on Sunday morning in two services. You cannot have a mega church telling people that Christmas is pagan, Easter is pagan, God does not love everybody, and say it all the time. You See, when John and most predestination preachers preach on predestination, they set off a certain day to preach that on. I put predestination every message I preach because it is without predestination, nobody's going to heaven without it. I've got a shirt on the back of it. It says predestination is the only way to heaven. And it is because if there's none that seeketh after God and there's none good and you're dead in sin, how are you going to will yourself to walk down an aisle and accept Christ? You can't. You're dead. He has to quicken, make alive his family. I don't understand, John. John, if you ever watch, I don't understand you. Me and you are the same age. I'm a month older than you. We probably started studying the Bible about the same time, except I've got a lot more sin in my life than you do. I don't have any doubt about that. I have sung in over 250 military-based clubs across America. I've sung in colleges. I've been on TV with a bunch of heathens. I've stood two feet from Dolly Parton in a, some shows we did back years ago, except there was about a trillion miles between her. She stood and where I stood. 
because I would never get to where she is. It takes a lot of compromise to do that. I guess you gather, I don't care for wealthy stars. I believe Dolly Parton is going to hell one day. Mainly because the Bible says, Woe are you when all men speak well of you. Everybody speaks well of Dolly Parton, don't they? She's a sweet lady. No, she never, ha she never has anything to say about Jesus, ever. She may have something to say about religion from time to time. But it says her grandfather or some one of them was a Pentecostal preacher and she's relying on that, I guess, to get her to heaven. That's enough reading. Enough. Of, let me give some announcements. We're on TV all over the country and a whole bunch of TV stations. About 270 total. And, uh, and we're on the internet all over the world. We live stream every Wednesday night at 6.30 Central Standard Time in the United States. So if you're out on the East Coast, it'll be 7.30. If you're out west, it may be two hours earlier at 4.30. So tune in and watch us live and be... I have people write to me from everywhere and they say, I don't know what to do. I don't have any church I can go to. Nobody's telling the truth. I say, join us online and you can be part of us. I believe people that are watching out there around the world, they are part of this ministry. We don't have a big crowd here. We never will have. You can't have a mega church preaching all these truths that I teach. There's no possible way. They're not women like their Christmas. They like their Easter and their Easter eggs and their bunnies and stuff like that. And all that's heathenism. We try to help some of the needy believers. We got people that are needy around the world and and every first of the month, about 26th or 27th, I sit down at the kitchen table and make out, uh, make out, I go to the bank first and get these checks for people. We give away about $2,500 to $3,000 a month. We give that away free. We don't even ask anybody to give. Because these are people that can't hardly live. We've got a lady in Australia. She's got cancer. She's just really struggling. She goes in and out of remission. And uh, we got Robin Peters down in Amarillo, Texas. She's got leukemia. And just really having a hard time. She goes in and out of remission. We love you, Robin. And Wael, her son, and uh, they came up and visited us. We love them. We sent her at least three hundred every month, and we we give money to other people that are. You have to be a believer, and you have to believe be believing what we're saying in order for us to help support you and your sickness or in your health or your bills there's a lot of people we give money to we give money to uh, Danielle Thigpen down in southern Louisiana Danielle's going through some hard times we send her 200 a month to help her on her bills and then we made an appeal throughout the internet to, she had a wreck 16 years ago and became paraplegic and she can't get around. And uh, we've encouraged her to get involved in a government program. They will help her get a job, but she's got to have a job. She's got to be hired before we can give her this van. And uh, the van is a wheelchair accessible van. It's got the starter right at the steering wheel and the brakes and the accelerator. And she 
she'll be able to drive it herself, even though she can't move from the waist down. And Danielle, just keep working on this government program so as you get it. We got the money in the bank to get you the van. All you got to do is call us and tell us and who to talk to down there. But she's struggling with a lot of personal things. And uh, if you're wondering, those of you that have given, some people have given very liberally to her cause, I promise you I'm not ever going to do this again because <laughs> it has been difficult. Sometimes when you're paraplegic, they don't know how to go about doing all this government program stuff. But she's got to go through that in order for the government to pay half of the van. And that'll leave her another forty-five or $50,000 that we can send her some of that each month for her to live on. But I'm waiting for her. We got the money, Danielle, in the bank. I point this way because the bank's right across the street. It's in the bank. I don't know what to do to prove it to you. All you have to do is get through the program, and the van is yours. The money is yours. It's not going to go to anybody else. I do not mix the benevolent fund with the operational fund. It's not mixed. The benevolent fund goes to the needy people only. So if you send money, just make your check out to Grace and Truth Ministries and put on the bottom of the checks X amount of dollars for tithe, whatever you want to give, and X amount of dollars for the needy. And that'll go into the benevolent fund. When I go to the bank, I went today, and I put 300 400 about $450 in the benevolent fund today. I just make the deposit separate. And I really have a heart for needy believers. I have been a needy believer years ago. And I really want to pick them up and encourage them that we love them and care about them. Our picnic, we got a, it's not a picnic, it's a chili cookout. We're going to have that October the 7th down here at Rock and Recreation Center. If you want to come and visit us, come and see us. And we'll help you if you don't have enough money. We'll help you get down here uh, all we can help and uh, just Contact me if you want to be a part of the ministry. Look at our online, look at our website, graceandtruth.net. That's graceandtruth.net. And my 800 number will be on there. That rings at my house. I will answer it personally. So all you got to do is call us and tell us you're interested in coming and we'll help you. And then we meet every Friday night over at our production area on Irvin Drive. We meet there to package DVDs to send them all over the world and all over the United States. The DVDs... Postage packaging handling is free. We don't charge anything for it. And we don't ask you for money. That's between you and God. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. God, I pray that you'll strengthen the flock, strengthen the sheep. They need to be strong in the faith. And God, I... Yeah, I'd ask you to fight our battles. We don't fight anybody anymore, anytime. I may call them down for their sin, but I won't fight them. Thank you for truth. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher here at Grace and Truth Ministries. I've been talking to you about the orgay of man. I had a guy fight me over the orgay, trying to prove to me that the orgay could be God's anger. Don't believe that? I don't care what profession you're listening to, mister. I don't even remember who you are. I think your name was John. Anyway, over here in Hebrews, i got to take you back to Hebrews, the fourth chapter, the third chapter, and there's something you have missed in this chapter. The Bible, orge is the word in the Greek, O R O R. An R looks like our P, except it's it's like their R with the front leg knocked off. O R. Take our R, knock off the front leg. O R G. The G is the third letter of the Greek alphabet. O R G. Ada. And the Ada is always feminine gender. Now, I do not believe that God ever refers to himself in feminine gender, ever. I don't care what this man says. He says he's gone to school and he's found out that it's, uh, uh, that the, there's, God's gender can be feminine. I don't believe, I don't care what professor you've been listening to. Did you know I've found that Greek professors differ with one another about what things mean? I found that out by studying after them. I had one of the Greek professors, a real famous one that wrote a book, that wrote a Greek book, uh, New Testament Greek for beginners or something like that. Now, not G. Gresham Mason, but another one, Basics of Biblical Greek. And he says he was a Baptist preacher. Well, being a Baptist, he's got to be believing, dipping in water and believing Christmas, so I don't believe in him. It doesn't matter if some guy's a Greek professor. I believe some people, they have invented a lot of things. And what he did, he tried to take me to task over Hebrews, the third chapter. I want to show you what he's talking about. He doesn't even look at the context. Hebrews, the third chapter, the third chapter of Hebrews, and the Bible says, I'm going to read it to you, and re there's a context reference here it is referring Hebrews 3 is referring back to Numbers the 14th chapter and actually every time they would murmur against God and here in Hebrews 3 he's talking about Moses in verse 5 and Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a man over his own house, whose house are we? Am I in the right? Yeah, I'm in the right. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation it was Israel provoking God with their anger against Moses and Aaron having taken them out to the wilderness and they said he took us out here to die. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation. I want to show you the context of this. Go to Numbers, the 14th chapter. Numbers 14. Numbers 14, it's all about Israel being in the wilderness, getting upset at Moses because he took them out there to die. They had no water. They had no food until God rained manna down from heaven. And then they said, well, what about meat? Boy, they were arguing and fighting God and Moses all the time. That's what this context is. Now look here in the 14th chapter, and there's a verse down here. 
I'll go ahead and read verse 11. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke? me that's what he says this is in the days of provocation when they provoked God now the word provoke doesn't mean to rise up God's anger the word provoke naughts means to be contemptible or to to uh, to worry God with this to to make God upset at the people provoke naughts N-A-A-T-S. This is the provocation of the people provoking God in the wilderness. Let's start in verse 1 there. And I'm going to show you what this third chapter of Hebrews is about. Start in verse 1. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. And the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel murmured against Moses. They were always fighting Moses. He brought us out here to die in the desert. And against Aaron and the whole congregation said unto them, Would to God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in the wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword out here in the desert by our enemies? This is the or gay that God is upset at. He's upset at the or gay of the people. Because they're mad at God and Moses and Aaron. You brought us out here to die. That our wives and our children should be a prey to all these pagans, these Amalekites out here and all the rest of them. Would, were it not better for us to return to Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make us a captain that take us back to Egypt. Do you know if you read, Numbers is one of the most interesting books. It, it doesn't look like it's interesting by the title, Numbers. Numbers is all the time they spent in the wilderness murmuring against God. That is a terrific book to read and to study. Because it's 40 years in the wilderness, they're fighting Moses and Aaron and God. Let us make a captain and return into Egypt. And Moses and Aaron fell upon their faces before all the assembly of the congregation and the children of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Japuna which were of them, they searched the land, rent their clothes. Joshua and Caleb believed God. They were the only two that were allowed to go in the land after all of this murmur against, against God. And they, but they argued with God and Moses all the way through the wilderness. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. They were told in the previous chapter to go up and to search out the land of Anak, which is the Gaza Strip to us. It was the land of the Philistines on the southwestern border of Israel. If the Lord delight in, in, in us... He will bring us into the land and give it unto us, a land where it floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord. This is Aaron. This is Joshua and Caleb telling the people this. Neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. We're going to go in and take them. Talking about the land of Anak. I've told you all the story before. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. We're going to kill you along with Aaron and Moses, Joshua and Caleb. We're going to kill you too. Israel was crazy. Of course, they were crazy in the New Testament, too. 
And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And that's when the Lord said unto Moses, How long will these people provoke me? This is the propagation. The provocation he's talking about in Hebrews, the third chapter. He's upset at their orge. That was the people that had an orge. And how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed upon them? I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation, Moses. It will be just you. Whew, man, God is angry at them. But it wasn't God's anger. It was because of their orge. And mightier than they. And Moses said unto the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear it, for thou broughtest up this people in thy might from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of the land, for they have heard that thou, Lord, art among this people, that thou, Lord, art seen face to face, and that the, thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by day and time in a pillar of a cloud, and by pillar of fire by night. Now if thou kill off all this people, Moses is pleading with God, don't kill all the people. Let them know who you are. Then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he swore unto them, therefore he has slain them all, killed them all in the wilderness. And so God says, Okay. And then they just keep on fighting all through here. They keep on wanting to give a heart. Now let's go back to Hebrews. Hebrews, so that's what he's talking about. And Christ, and he says, Harden not your hearts, verse 8 of chapter 3. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. He said, just for this murmuring, because you would not go into the land of Anak. You wouldn't go into the land. Here they are down here in the wilderness. They're at Kadesh Barnea. And this is Israel. Israel. And this is the Gaza Strip, what we call it, Gaza Strip. But it was the land of Anak back then. And it was also the land of the Philistines. Then God says, I'm going to make you one in the wilderness until I kill off everybody 20 years old and upward as of Kadesh Barnea because you murmured against God and everybody 20 years old and upward except Joshua and Caleb. They said, we will go in and whip these giants because we know that God is with us. Whew. So that's what he's talking about here in Hebrews, the third chapter. Now let's keep reading. When your fathers proved me and saw my works 40 years, God says, you got to wonder, 40 years Till I bring every kind of devastation upon Israel and kill off everybody as of Kadesh Barnea above 20 years old. Why 20? That was army age in Israel. You had to be 20. And all the armies said, we can't go in there and kill these people. They're tall men. They were probably Goliath's ancestors, eight and a half, nine feet tall. They said, we can't, we can't take them on. And they forgot that God had just recently destroyed the largest army in the world, Pharaoh and his armies in the Red Sea. 
Then he says, Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, I was grieved with the generation. He was he did not have an orgay at him. I was grieved with them. They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, my hodos. It's a narrow way in the Old Testament, just like it is in the New. It's a narrow tribulation way. God didn't take them out there to die. If you think you're going through trials in your life and he brought you there to die, he didn't. Not as a believer. So I swear in my wrath, it doesn't say my wrath at all. It says, oh, I swore in te O R G Ada. The feminine, Ada is always feminine. The feminine wrath. It's why is it feminine wrath? Because they were involved in the wilderness in their idolatry of self. They were seeking self. They wouldn't believe in God. So he said, I swore. It doesn't say my wrath. It says, so I swore in the wrath, the orge that was mu, M-U, of me. God is saying this wrath that was going on, and the reason they were murmuring was because I set them up to murmur because I was going to call the Gentiles by my name. That's what the Bible says in Romans eleven eleven. Did the did Israel simply fall and stumble just to stumble? God forbid they fell. Every time this happened, it was God's will. See, this is why this fellow don't believe in this. He don't like God's will doing things that he wants to do. He wanted Israel to fall. He arranged for those people those unbelievers to do what they did so he could kill them. See, people don't think God creates evil, but he does. So I swore in the wrath of the people because they did not know my hodos, my ways, the way that I worked. He said, my ways aren't your ways and your ways aren't my ways. Your thoughts aren't my thoughts. You can't think like God. They shall, I said, they will not enter into my rest. He was saying, this whole subject is about Numbers 14. They're not going to enter into, into Canaan. They're not going to enter into, here's the, there's the Sea of Galilee. Here's the Dead Sea. Here's the Jordan River. They're not going to come up here and cross the Jordan with with Joshua leading them. Everybody 20 years old and upwards is going to die except for Joshua and Caleb. That's it. Well, there's a lot to that. The whole context of this, Mr. John, whoever you are, whole context of this is what Israel was doing in the wilderness. They were angry and enraged at Moses and Aaron and God. You read the book of Numbers, you're going to see Israel is just constantly speaking against Moses and God. Constantly. Even Aaron and Miriam, his sister, spoke against Moses in the previous chapters. Said, well, who does he think he is? Moses, you're just a younger brother of me. I'm Miriam, your older sister, and Aaron's your older brother. Who do you think you are? You took too, too much on yourself. Take heed, brethren. And that word rest is kataposis. K-A-T-A-P-A-U-S-I-S. means to rest, pause down, to rest. And he refers to entering into the promised land as the rest of God or the Sabbath of God. All you have to do is believe God to enter into his Sabbath. Everything that is happening in the world is ordained by God, the good and the evil. And if you can come to that, 
everything that's happening. You're not supposed to go and look for revenge. I'm going to finish this up, but what I want to do is go back to where we were our last lesson and show you some things. If there's anybody in the Bible that had a right to revenge over anybody else I've ever seen, it was David over King Saul. David had not done anything to King Saul. Let me read this title. The Orge, Revenge and Anger, is man's nature. Let me show you that one more time. Let me show you that. Back to Ephesians, the second chapter. This is man's nature. Do you know that fighting somebody, God will get revenge in his time when he wants to. You don't have to get revenge on anybody. You don't ever have to get angry at anybody. It doesn't do any good. Have you ever noticed you never got revenge before? Have you ever noticed you got mad at people and you never changed their mind? Never. That doesn't help. Have you ever noticed that who you're arguing with, sometimes they're very unreasonable people and you can't change them? How do you change somebody? Was a soft answer that turns away wrath. And grievous words stirreth up anger. Grievous words are the words of a man involved in his orge. Look here in Ephesians, the second chapter. Ephesians, the second chapter. This is man's nature. Ephesians, second chapter. Look here in verse 3. Well, let's go to read down to it. And you hath he quickened, zumpa'el, made alive. If you were dead in sin, you had no ability to will yourself to walk down an aisle or to come to Christ. None. There's none that seeketh after God. That's why predestination is necessary to go to heaven. He has to pick himself a people out, put them through trials and persecution, and finally put faith in their heart. And they say, I give up, Lord, I surrender to you. Because he's the one that puts faith in their heart. You cannot conjure up faith. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, in time past, what he's saying, Ephesian Gentile church, in time past you were out and out sinners. You walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, according to Satan. And the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. He's talking to a Gentile Ephesian church. You walked that way among whom also we have our conversation, anastrophe, A-N-A, S-T-R-O-P-H-E. Our anastrophe, our conversation in times past, in the lust of the flesh. You, you, you lived in the lust, the epithumia, Epi, this is the common word lust. Epi, T-H-U-M-I-A. To breathe hard, superimposing that on your life. That's like, I, 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 I want that car. I, I want that woman. I, I want that man. I want what I want. That's lust. And you do anything to have it. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh, the outer man. That outer man wants his way. In order to in order to get over the outer man, you have to have an inner man, and that's a new birth. And Jesus will put you through the fire until he gets rid of self. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. What's your Thinking, you've got to bring your thinking into subjection to Christ according to the 10th chap chapter of 2 Corinthians. And we're by nature, ginos, 
G-E-N-U-S. We're by Genos, G-E-N-U-S. We get the word that from the word genomai. Cause to be. Organesis, G-E-N-N-E-S-I-S. That's the same word as Genesis means beginning. That was your nature. By nature, children of orge. That's man's nature. He is feminine because Babylon mothered all idolatry and they were idolizing their own selves in Numbers, the 14th chapter. This guy, John, has just missed all of the context of it. That's not the orge of God. It's the orge of man that God says, I'm fed up with them over there in the wilderness. They're murmuring against me and Moses and want to kill us all. And they're children of wrath. Now, I've got to go back to... So, you used to be children of orge. You've got to get over the orge. Go back over here. The, it's led me into a long, deep study. Look over here. And back here to Romans 12. I've got to go back where we left off last week. Romans 12. And I got to show you what's connected to this orge. The orge is, I have gone through the New Testament. How do you do this? Let me show you. You look up the word in the, you look up the word in a concordance, the word orge. And then you take the same number in the word study concordance. It'll tell you every time the word orge is mentioned. And I've gone through here and looked at every one of these words orge. And it always has to do with man's rage and anger. And we're going to look at a man. We're going to look at King Saul that had orge against David, and David said, I cannot get revenge on Saul. That's God's business, not mine. That's the best illustration of it from one end of the Bible to the other. Saul was trying to kill David every day of his life. Saul was the king of Israel. But Saul had messed up, and God had taken him off the throne. And told Samuel, you go down to the house of Jesse in southern Israel. I've chosen me a king among his sons. I preached on this many times. But I want to point out the orge that Saul had. He, wanted, he was after David every day. From the 18th chapter of 1 Samuel 18 all the way to the 31st chapter of 1 Samuel, he was trying to trap David and kill him every day. So I'll kill him. He's trying to steal my throne. David wasn't stealing anything. It wasn't a David's idea to be the king of Israel. It was God's idea. I mean, Saul believed in Samuel. And after, after Samuel had told Saul, he said, Saul, you have not fulfilled God's, God's word to you. It starts off, Saul becomes king. God has Samuel anoint him in 1 Samuel, the ninth chapter. In the 8th chapter, the people say, we want a man to be king over us. And Samuel kept saying, but God is your king. And God has got an arsenal like you, you cannot have in a man king. We want a man king that has bows and arrows and shields and those big things that throw 
rocks at, at uh, cities. And we want a man king. And God is saying, Samuel tells the people, but look, God has got earthquakes and, and fire from heaven and great big wind that can blow men away. And you want bows and arrows instead of that? Are you out of your mind? They said, we want a man anyway. So God gives them Saul. Gives them Saul in the ninth chapter. But Saul's from the wrong tribe. Saul is of the tribe of Benjamin. That's the twelfth son of Jacob. The, the king has to come out of the fourth son, Judah. So when God appoints Saul out of the tribe of Benjamin... When God appoints Saul, God has to plan that Saul is going to goof up in the future. God has to plan that. Saul comes from the wrong tribe. The scepter will not depart from Judah. And David comes from Judah. The scepter will never depart from Judah, nor a law given between his feet till Shiloh come. Let me read the rest of this title. Revenge is not the quality of a true believer. Revenge or, should I say, or gay. Same thing. Revenge is not a quality of the true believer. It is in every man that God will conquer over time. You'll get over your revenge. God will put you in such bad way. You won't know what to do. Example, King Saul and David. King Saul and David. I'm going to go through Saul's anger and rage at David. Now, but first of all, I want to go back through this 12th chapter of Romans. Romans 12. You have got to get what this is saying. Romans 12 and verse 16. Verse 16. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things. The word mind is the word... Proneo means to think not upon lofty things. Don't think about getting on top of the world in your business. Don't think about being a star. I know about that. Toward one another, mind not high things, but condescend. Take yourself down low to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own eyes. Recompense no man evil for evil. Don't say, I'll get you back. I've got an orgy in me, and I'll get you. That's what Saul was doing. King Saul was trying to get David. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as such as lieth in you, live peaceable with all men everywhere. Not just with believers. I believe in getting along in the world. I don't believe in starting fights with anybody. If I get a chance, I'll witness to anybody in public, anywhere, anytime. But I won't be mean. I'll just say that's not what the Bible says. I wear shirts all the time that says God doesn't love everybody. I wore one today with Jesus on the front of it on a great white horse coming back in Revelation 19. And on the back it says, Jesus is coming back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on all those that know not God and that obey not the gospel. Do you know how to obey the gospel? He's coming back to take vengeance on you if you don't know how to obey the gospel. The gospel is the narrow way. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves when somebody does something bad to you. First of all, you know you're not dealing with the world. Do you not know that you're dealing with the world? 
And most of the people in the world are going to hell, and most of the people in the world are vessels of wrath, fitted to destruction. Do you not know that yet? Majority of the world is going to hell. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. And few there be that find it. Only a few will find the narrow way. Wide is the gate that leads to destruction. And many there be that go in there at. So most, in all probability, when you start fighting somebody, you're talking to a vessel of wrath that doesn't have good sense. Did you realize that? Even if they are a believer, the best way to treat them is with a gentle word. But rather, give place to wrath. Give place. Place means, it means let it happen. Give place to or gay. Why? You think you can fix it? When it says, avenge not yourself, avenge is the word ek duke, ek, ek d-i-k-e-o. That's the word avenge. It means, it comes from dk, which is the word right. And the word ek means out. It means to write out or to fix it. You can't fix somebody's mind. God says, I will do the fixing in my time. That's what he does to King Saul. He fixes Saul's mind. David says at one point, I cannot fix Saul. I'm not even supposed to. He's the anointed of God. And God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Vengeance is basically the same word as avenge, not yourself. Vengeance, ek de cases, e k d i k e s i s. It means to write out or to fix somebody's wagon. I'll fix them. No, you won't. Nobody will ever, I have never ever argued with anybody in my life that they finally said, oh, I see what you mean. Never. Have you? Have you ever had an argument with anybody? And finally, in the middle of the argument, they're just giving you thunder and all of a sudden they will say, I see you there. I see your point. No, when they're hard heads, they're not going to see it. And neither are you. So he says, vengeance is mine, I will pay, thus saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him to drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, I'm going to tell you about King Saul and David. First of all, I've got to go back. To 1 Samuel. Let's go back to 1 Samuel, the 19th chapter. 19th chapter is where Saul comes after David. Actually, he starts coming after him in the 18th chapter. David goes out and kills Goliath in the 17th chapter. I'm talking about the Orge. Saul was full of it. King Saul was a wicked. He wasn't just a wicked man. When he first come, when when Samuel first runs into the Saul, the Bible says King Saul was a goodly man. There was not a goodlier man in all of Israel. And Saul was the tallest man in Israel. Tallest man. And he was a goodly man. But it just shows you just how wicked. Saul shows you how wicked one of God's elect can be. <laughs> Boy, he was some kind of character. So he's picked out to be king. But he comes from the wrong tribe. So God's got to plan ahead and have Saul be wicked and evil.
And Saul comes to his first battle in First Samuel. First Samuel, the eleventh chapter, and this is when the king of the Ammonites. Let me show you where the Ammonites are. Ammon, A M M O N, is what we would call. You see that? This is Israel right here. Right here. This is. Right above that is Lebanon, or what we would call, ancient world would call it Tyre and Sidon, right above Israel. And right here is the land of Jordan. It looks like a pan. It's right next door to Israel. This is the land of Jordan. Here's Israel. And this is Jordan right here. This is Jordan. And Amon Jordan, A-M-M-O-N, is the capital of Jordan. Jordan is just east of Israel. And then you've got Egypt down here. you got the Mediterranean Sea right here. And you've got, you got Lebanon right here, or Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon, and that's where Jezebel lived. And her father, Ethbel, had the gods Baal in the grove. And when the kingdom was split, Ahab, who was king of northern Israel, somehow at some party one night, he saw Jezebel and said, Boy, she is a hot, foxy woman. I want her. And he married Jezebel and brought her gods down into Israel. We're talking about Ammon here. We're talking about, and of course, you've got the land of southern Israel. Southern Israel over here. This is southern Israel. And the land of Benjamin is right here. And Saul was from the land of Benjamin. And Jerusalem is in the land of Benjamin. You would think it would be in southern Judah, but it wasn't. The king comes from Judah. And Saul comes from Benjamin. And Jerusalem and the temple are in Jerusalem. So, so Saul comes from Ammon. Or he, comes from, he comes from Benjamin right here. And Jerusalem is in Benjamin. And then Moab is down here, Moab. Where did Ammon and Moab come from? When, when uh, down here in the land of Edom, which is the land of Esau, which has no promise of God in it, uh, when God said, told Lot to get out of the land of, to get out of, of the plains of Jordan where he had chosen to go. Lot had to leave Jordan. And when he came out, he and his daughters went into a mountain somewhere in this area. And they had a sexual relationship with him, not because of sex itself, but because they wanted they wanted to be sure the seed of their father was kept alive. And Moab and Ben Ami were the two sons of the daughters of Lot, and they named this land next door to Israel. Those are the first cousins of Israel. They named, they named that Moab and Ammon, those two sons. Now, I don't know why I sidetracked there, but anyway. Let's go back over here to 1 Samuel. Now, what is happening? I've got to show you why Saul is angry at David. Why has he got this orge in his heart above David? Saul comes out of the land of 
in the ninth chapter, God tells Samuel to go. He tells him where to go. And he runs into Saul. And God says, this is the man I want you to know as king. Therefore, Samuel and Saul become real good friends. They get real close to each other. And then Samuel, I, so he anoints Samuel to be, uh, he anoints Saul to be king over Israel. That was the will of God. And then in the 11th chapter, that's when the Ammonites, I had shouldn't have erased that. The land of Ammon over here. Nahash, the king of Ammon, says, I'm going to attack Jabesh Gilead. Now, Jabesh Gilead is up here, up here in just right across the Jordan River in what was called Gilead at one time. That's part of Jordan now, Gilead. When you look at the ancient map of the world over here, the way God divided up the land between all the tribes of Israel, he gave Manasseh, the firstborn son of Joseph, he gave him two sides of the Jordan River. I always wondered why he would give them that much land. It was probably waste land. And their younger brother, his, his younger brother, there was Manasseh and Ephraim. Ephraim was the younger brother of Manasseh. But Ephraim had the, had the inheritance of all Israel, not Manasseh. And so uh, the, in, the, in the land of Manasseh, on the east side of the Jordan River was the, was the town of Jabesh Gilead. Well, Saul, who was king over all of Israel heard that this, this man Nahash was going to attack Jabesh Gilead and the word went out and Saul said I won't put up with that and he put together over 300,000 soldiers and he attacked the, the thing is Mr. Nahash he gave He gave the men of Jabesh Gilead, uh, he gave them a statement. He said, you've got, I want you to surrender to me. If you don't surrender, he said, you have to surrender. I want all the men in Jabesh Gilead, I want their right eyes put out. And I want you to surrender to me. Why the right eye? Because that's the one they aimed with. That was a war eye. Most men are right-handed and right-eyed. He said, I want the right eye punched out. And when that happens, I will submit you and you will become my servants. And Saul got a hold of that. And so that's in the 11th chapter of 1 Samuel. And Saul goes kind of berserk he gets crazy he says this is not going to happen and he goes and delivers the men of Jabesh Gilead they never forgot Saul for that at Saul's death in the 31st chapter it was the men of Jabesh Gilead that went and got his body and buried it in honor so how is this happening with David in the 12th chapter of First Samuel, in the 12th chapter, that's where Saul receives his coronation. That's where he has becomes officially the king of Israel. And Samuel, Samuel stands over that coronation. And Samuel tells the people, now you remember, you can't go after other gods if you do. God will send the sword, the famine, the pestilence over and over again if you go after these other gods. And he said, Samuel said, now 
He'll either send you no rain or he'll send you too much rain and it'll mildew your crops. Do you understand? They're going, oh God, please don't do that to us. And they wasn't serious evidently because they did go after Bell and the Grove. Then in the 13th chapter, 13 through 15, Saul never does the will of God that he's supposed to do. And God gets his fill. I would go through the 13th and 14th chapters, but I want to get to David. In the 15th chapter, God tells Saul, go down to Amalek and kill everything there. Men, women, children, Boys and girls, old women, old men, all the cattle, all the goats, all the sheep. Kill everything. Boy, that sounds awful harsh. Why? When they came out of Egypt, when they came out of Egypt, here's Egypt. They came out and crossed the, the Red Sea. The first people from this desert was the Amalekites. And God told them, this is about 200 years later, and they're in Israel, and Saul is the king of Israel, and he tells Saul, you go, and he sends by Samuel, the word comes from Samuel, you go down and utterly kill all these Amalekites, kill their king and everything. Saul goes down there in the 15th chapter, and this is where this is leading up to why Saul hates David so much. David's not on the scene now. He's not even on the scene yet. So Saul goes down there and those Amalekites had done an unprovoked attack on Israel when they came out of Egypt and Israel's completely unarmed and untrained. So they attack Israel coming out of there. They think it's all over with. 200 years later, that's when God says, Saul, go down and kill everything in Amalek. Why would he say that? No one was practicing these laws of separation except Israel. They could have had every kind of disease in Amalek. I don't want any of those cattle there. And even those babies, if you kill them, they'll go be with the Lord. I don't want anything up here. Well, Saul goes down there and he brings some of the sheep back, some of the cattle back. And Samuel says, did you do the will of God in Amalek? And Saul said, yes, I did. Then Samuel said, what is this bleating, B-L-E-A-T-I-N-G, which is a sound that a sheep makes? What is this bleating sound that I hear sheep. And what is those goats sound? What are they doing here? And, and you got that King Agag here? You didn't do what God said. He said kill everything. And Saul says, well, I wanted to offer sacrifice to God. That's when Samuel made that great statement. It's better to obey than sacrifice. It's better to obey God than perform some ritual. That's what he was saying. And Samuel said, give me a sword. And he took a sword and hacked. Agag to pieces. Can you imagine taking a swing at Agag and he cuts half his head off? Then he starts cutting his neck off and just good Samuel did that. And God said, that's enough. I've had all I can take of this King Saul. That's when he says, you go down 
to Bethlehem, Judah. Saul is up here in Jerusalem in the land of Benjamin. He said, you go down to Bethlehem, Judah, to Bethlehem. Ain't that amazing? Go to Bethlehem where Jesus will be born. And go to the house of Jesse. Good name, Jesse. For I've chosen me a king among his sons. This is where Saul gets. It was God's idea to appoint David king. It was not David's idea. That's the whole reason for Saul's. That's the whole reason for Saul's or gay. Because he keeps thinking it's David's idea. So he sends, he sends Samuel down to the house of Jesse in Bethlehem. And Saul is up here in Jerusalem. And he sends him down to the house of Jesse. And he says, God has sent me here to choose a king among your sons. And Jesus said, surely it must be Eliab. He's my eldest son. Besides that, he's the tallest son. He's the, one of the tallest men in around. And God is saying, I've already had the tallest man in Israel, Saul. I don't need another tall man. Tall doesn't mean nothing. Even Samuel said, what a specimen of a specimen of a man. This Eliab is he's one of the Saul's greatest soldiers. Surely this must be the Lord's anointed. And you know what God said about Eliab? The Bible says, God hath not chosen this. He called Eliab a this. And that's something. And then he marched out of Benadab. Abinadab. And God says, no, that's not him either. Notice who's doing the picking. It's not anyone but God. It's not even Samuel picking it. And he marched seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. He said, it's none of these. He said, after seven sons, he said, do you have anyone else? He said, the remaineth that the youngest, and he keeps the sheep. He said, I'm not leaving here until you bring him out. And Samuel says to one of the other sons, go out and get David. David comes in. He's the youngest one in Israel. He was ruddy-faced. Ruddy means red-faced. Some writers believe he may have had red hair and freckles since he was red-faced. He didn't look like Gregory Peck in those old movies. He looked like a short, runty kid. And when he walked in, God said, that's him. David. Notice who did the picking. It was God, not Samuel, not David himself. But Saul is going to be mad at David assuming the throne because, and his, his orge is going to be lifted up and he's going to get furious with David. Well, an evil spirit from God enters Saul in that 16th chapter after David is anointed by God. Probably the word is out. And Saul, being having an evil spirit, they said he needs to have somebody play some music for him. So they send David over, and David takes his harp and plays and sings for Saul. And Saul is familiar with David. That's in the 16th chapter. Then the 17th chapter, David goes out and slays Goliath. Because he does this, this causes the women of Israel to lift up David. David is taken by Abner, Saul's commanding general, and he takes him to King Saul and says, here's the man that killed Goliath. And as David is entering the city, the women are singing in the background, 
Saul has killed his thousands, but David is ten thousands, and Saul is livid. He grabs a spear and throws it to David. And from that point on, from 1 Samuel, the 18th chapter, all the way to the 31st chapter, Saul is out to kill David because of his jealousy and his orge. Something else. I, there's not a better example of a man's orge in all the Bible now. I want us to go over here and look at some of this. In the 19th chapter, that's where Saul gets after David. Well, he actually gets after him in the 18th chapter. In the 18th chapter, Saul, Saul tells David, he's mad at him for one thing. He just threw a javelin at him. That's a spear. And he missed him. And he tells David, he sees that the people love David. He's a gentle man with a gentle heart. And he says, we've got to uh, do something about this David. So he conspires against David and says, David, what I want you to do, I want you to be ahead of my secret service. I want you to be ahead of my protection, my protective squad. And I, what I want you to do, I want you to go out and I want you to bring back a hundred foreskins of Philistines. He doesn't mean he wants them to circumcise them. He wants David to emasculate them and bring their foreskins, their penis along with their gonads back. I want them brought back in a sack. See, Saul believed David was going to be killed when he went out after a hundred Philistines. And he says, if you go get them, I will give you my daughter, Merab. She is beautiful. She's gorgeous, drop dead gorgeous. David says, I like that. David's about 17 or 18 years old. He's proficient with the sling because that's where he hit Goliath with. So he says, I'll give you Merab. He goes out and brings back 200 foreskins of Philistines. Saul is shocked. He just can't believe his eyes and his ears. So he says, well, I'm sorry, David. I've already married off Merab to another man. I'll give you Michael, my other daughter. David takes Michael, but he wanted Merab. He takes Michael, and Michael ends up being a headache to him. So in the 19th chapter, that's when Saul says, i got to get David. Go get him. In the meantime, Michael had helped David hide a dummy in his bed. A dummy. I don't know how they made it. Just made up a, some cotton or something. Maybe it looked like he's asleep. When they come in to get him, that's when they say he's not there. He's slipped away and got away. Saul is wanting to kill him. Now, Saul, let me give you this. An evil spirit from God entered Saul in 1614. In 1814, the 18th chapter of 14 verse, an evil spirit entered Saul. In 1841, he cast a javelin at David. In 1909, he cast another javelin. He's, he's got a fiery temper. He likes to get back at people that are hurting him. And David runs to Ramah. In that chapter, Ramah is a hill above Jerusalem. And he goes to the Naoth. Naoth is the school of the prophets. Jerusalem is here. Just a few miles up the road is Ramah. 
wherever, when Jerusalem, you're supposed to be able to see Jerusalem from Ramah and as a hill. Here's Jerusalem. Just above Jerusalem is Ramah. David is running, trying to get away from Saul and hide from him. Saul is out to get David. I'm talking about a man's orge. What I'm talking about. Nobody had a bigger orge than Saul. He wants to kill David. He thinks David stole his throne. And David didn't do nothing. He just took the word of God from Samuel and said, You're to be king here. So at the time, at this time, at this time, Saul is the recognized king of Israel, but David is the recognized king by God. And Saul is out to get him. In chapter 20, look at chapter 20. In chapter 20, David runs. He, Saul goes to catch David in 19, and David's gone. And David runs. Let's read a little here in 20. And David fled from Naoth in Ramah and came and said before Jonathan, the son of Saul. Jonathan believed in David and loved David. And Jonathan believed David was supposed to be the king of Israel. Jonathan was turning on his father because he believed his father was wrong. And Jonathan, David said to Jonathan, what have I done? What did I do? I didn't do anything but what Samuel told me to do. And your father wants to kill me? What have I done? What is mine iniquity? David said, I, I can't tell what I did to your father, John, to your father Saul. And what is my sin before thy father that he seeketh my life? It's because he was jealous of David. He was envious of David. David was going to be the king and Jonathan tells him that. What have I done? What's my iniquity? And he says, tomorrow's the new moon. And David says, there's one step between me and death. And in verse 17... And Jonathan caused David to swear again because he loved him for he loved him as he loved his own soul. Jonathan really loved David. He was a faithful friend to David. He believed he was going to be the king. And Saul's anger was kindled at Jonathan in verses 30 through 34. 30 through 34. And Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said unto Jonathan, Thou son of a perverse, rebellious woman. He got unreasonable with his own son, who was a godly man, because he was trying to preserve David. And he, so he insults him. He says, Your mother, which was one of my wives, she's a rebellious woman. Do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse, David, over me? To thine own confusion and to the confusion of thy mother's nakedness. For as long as the son of Jesse liveth, liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established nor thy kingdom. He's trying to say, Jonathan, this is going to be your kingdom. That's not who he was concerned with. It was his jealousy about his own kingdom. He's going to kill David. Wherefore now send and fetch him unto me, he shall surely die. David's going to die. He's stealing my kingdom. That ain't nothing but orge and envy. That's all it is. This is the best illustration in all the Bible. Does David think he has to do something about it? No. He just runs from Saul. And Jonathan answered and said, answered Saul his father and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain? What has he done, Father? 
Nothing. He just did what Samuel told him to do. He became king, Paul. Samuel said it's from God. So sometimes when you get angry at somebody over something God made happen, just because somebody is ahead of you in some promotion at work, it doesn't mean anything. It means that's what God's will was. And Saul cast a javelin at his own son Jonathan to smite him. Well, this guy's in a rage, isn't he? Especially for a man that was a goodly man in Israel when he started. Whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to kill David, to slay him. He wanted to kill him. So Jonathan gets loose. He goes and meets David. And they came in chapter 21. David goes to Nob. David goes to Nob. That's a, tab that's a place where the tabernacle and the ark. It's just above Jerusalem. And that's where the tabernacle and the ark of the covenant were being kept. David is... And David tells... Ahimelech. Ahimelech is the high priest. That's in the first verse. David tells Ahimelech, I have no weapon. I have no way to, to defend myself. So Ahimelech tells him, we've got the sword of Goliath here. We'll give that to you. It's wrapped up. So he goes and gets the sword of Goliath and gives it to David. And David... And Saul starts chasing David over there to Nob. And David flees and goes to, he's, he's right there at Jerusalem. And he goes to Gath. If this is, if Jerusalem's right here, this is the land of Benjamin, there's Jerusalem. Gath is over here in the land of the Philistines. It's just about 25 miles from Jerusalem to Gath. And this is something amazing. He runs over to Gath. He meets up with the king of Gath, Achish. Now get a hold of this. Achish. A-C-H-I-S-H. Now, Achish is the king of Gath. Do you remember who came from Gath? Just Goliath came from Gath. So this had been Goliath's king, Achish, at Gath. Gath is the closest city to Jerusalem that's in the land of the Philistines. And the Philistine princes say, isn't this the one that the women were saying? They were singing that song about David hath, Saul hath killed his thousands and David has killed ten thousands. Isn't he the one that killed Goliath? And David starts getting a little afraid. So he starts acting crazy. He starts scrabbling on the walls and like he's, something's wrong with his mind. Starts scrabbling on the walls and lets his spittle run down on his beard. And King Achish says, what do I need with a crazy man? But he makes friends with Achish because finally at the end of this book, he wants to join Achish in attacking Saul, but he doesn't really want to do that. It's a trap that David wants to set for Achish. Then you get to and David, well, that's where Achish says, have I need of a madman in verse 15? Then you get to chapter 20, 22. I just want to show you how angry Saul was at David. It wasn't even David's idea to be king. It was God's through Samuel. But Saul all through this book says, it's David, I'll get him. 
If I can kill him, maybe God will change his mind. In 22, David goes to Adullam. Everywhere he goes is somewhere in southern Israel. It's all down here. He's running around here, running away from Saul. It's Saul's rage and anger. And the Bible says, I love this verse 2 of chapter 22. This is one of my favorite verses because it sounds like Jesus. David's a type of Christ here. Let's read 1 and 2 of 22. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontent gathered themselves unto David and he became a captain over them and there were with him about 400 men. This is very significant. At one place he's got 400 men following him and another place he's got 600 following him. So if he's got 400 to 600 men, this is why when you get to the end of 2 Samuel, in 2 Samuel, the 23rd chapter, 2 Samuel, the 23rd chapter, David starts bragging on his mighty men and how many he's got. He names them off and how many people they killed. And God says, wait a minute. Do you think it's been mighty men that has delivered you? It has not been. It has been me. Because you only had 400 at one time. It worked up to 600 men. And, you, and he, in the 23rd chapter, he numbers. When you get to Second Chronicles, it gives you the exact number. He had a million eight hundred thousand men fighting for him, and he wants to brag. David wants to brag on that's why I won all these battles. God said, uh, "You think so?" He said, "I'm going to give you a little time to think about that." So God caused him to number Israel. When God called him to number it and he's taking credit, David is. God says, I'm going to give you a choice. And when you see earlier in his career where he's only got 400 men, at one place he's got 600 men. And he, when he gets at the end of, of 2 Samuel, God, this is what God says. But you've got to keep all this separated. You've got to know why God is killing all these people in Israel. And when you get over to 2 Samuel, the, the 24th chapter, God sends a prophet to David and says, So Gad the prophet came to David, verse, I'm in a great strait. I guess you are, David. I don't know what to do. I'm going to choose one of these three and God's going to nearly destroy me. I am in a great strait. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord with these three days of pestilence. I'll take that because God's merciful. Let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent Pestilence. People say God won't do bad things. God sent a pestilence upon Israel. From the morning even to the time appointed. And there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba. Dan is the most northern city. Beersheba is the most southern at this time. From Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 men 
died because David numbered Israel and took credit when he only had 400 at one time. It wasn't the number of people that wins a battle. It's God. And when the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented him of the evil. He turned from the evil and said to the death angel, I'm sure it was Michael, that's enough. I've killed enough. God killed him. People say God wouldn't kill. He said, I kill, I make alive, I wound, I heal, I do everything. It is enough. Stay thine hand now, death angel. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Aronah, a Jebusite, and David repented. And he went to Aronah and said, can I, offer, can I have your threshing floor? He said, yes. And David said, I'll buy, you, I'll buy it from you. And Aronah said, no, no, you can have it for free. And David said, here's David's words in verse 24. Neither will I offer burnt offering unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. He said, I will not offer anything to God of what doesn't cost me. I wish people felt like that in supporting the ministry. It costs to run a ministry. Now, let's get back over here too. I'm just going through and showing you how Saul was in a rage. Back to the 22nd chapter. There were 600 following David in verse 3 of the 22nd chapter. Then David goes to Mizpah of Moab. Hey, he's running from Saul. Saul keeps chasing him wherever he goes. Saul wants his life. So David goes over to Mizpah and Moab. He runs over here, gets away from the land of Israel, thinking maybe that'll save me over there. He runs to Mizpah. That's in... 22nd chapter. And then David goes to Hamath in Judah. Saul keeps chasing him everywhere he goes. He's running for his life. And then Saul, while he was at Nob, Ahimelech, the high priest, had fed David the bread the showbread in the temple. They changed the showbread at the, every seven days. So it must have been at the end of the seven days. So they were changing the showbread. And Ahimelech, the high priest, gave David food and gave him a sword, the sword of Goliath. Well, Saul comes and confronts Ahimelech. He says, you fed my enemy. He's not supposed to be the enemy. He's the guy that serenaded Saul to comfort his evil spirit that came upon him. So when you go down here to... How much time do I have, Mike? Eight, Eight minutes. I'll finish this up this chapter and then I'll come back next time and we'll finish this up I want you to see Saul's orge jealousy, rage envy because he thinks that David had done something that David did not do has anybody ever jumped your case about something you didn't do What are you supposed to do? The same thing David did. Leave it alone. David says God will bring revenge in his own time. That's the way it works. Does God ever get revenge on Saul? Oh, yeah. And he goes against the Philistines at the end of this book. And, and he's slaughtered in 
in a war with them. He's killed along with Jonathan, his son, along with his other sons. God destroys him. What you got to do is wait for God to destroy your enemy. Just say, Lord, deliver me. How many, y'all, y'all hear me pray, Lord, fight our battles for me. Every time I pray, I pray, Lord, fight my battles. I don't want to fight nobody anymore. I used to want to fight, and that's crazy. That's insane. Fighting people won't get you, it won't make you win. It won't win anything. Wait for the Lord. And he'll do what needs to be done as long as you're living for him. So he comes to Ahimelech, the high priest. In verse 14, Ahimelech so angered the king Saul and said, Who is so faithful among all thy servants as David? Nobody's more faithful than David, your servant. This is what Ahimelech tells Saul which is the king's son-in-law. He's your son-in-law. He's married to your daughter, Michael, and you promised him Mareb, and you didn't give him that one. He's faithful to you. And goeth at thy bidding, and is honorable in thy house. Did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Be it far from me, let not the king impute anything unto his servant, nor to all the house of thy father. For thy servant knew nothing of all this, less or more. And the king said, Thou shalt surely die, Hamelech. You're a high priest of Israel. And I'm going to kill you, have you killed. Boy, that's something you don't do, have the high priest killed. And the king said unto his footman that stood about him, this is really interesting, this verse. Turn and slay the priests of the Lord because of their hand also with David and because they knew when he fled and did not show it to me. But the servants of King Saul would not do Saul's bidding. We're not killing these priests. They're, rich, they're righteous men. Are you crazy, King Saul? No. And put forth their hand to fall upon the priests of God. And the king said unto Doeg, his servant, he was ahead of his, he was an Edomite. He didn't care if he killed these priests. Doeg was, the previous chapter says, Doeg, the Edomite, was the chiefest herdman that belonged to Saul in verse 7 of chapter 21. And Doeg said, I'll kill him. And the king said to Doeg, Turn thou and fall upon the priest. And Doeg the Edomite turned, and he fell upon the priest and slew on that day four score and five persons. He killed 85 priests of God, righteous man. Well, when a man gets his orge involved, he does some really unrighteous things. That's one of the most unrighteous things that Saul ever did, kill 85 godly men that did wear a linen ephod. And Nob, the city of the priest, smote he with the edge of the sword, both men, women, children, and suckling when the, with the edge of the sword. And one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of a high tub named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. He joins David. But Abiathar turns against David in 1 Kings, the first chapter. He joins Adonijah in his rebellion. You say you can't trust friends. Well, he couldn't trust Abiathar. He was good up to that point. Abiathar showed David that Saul had slain the Lord's priest. And David said unto Abiathar, I knew it that day when Doeg, the Edomite, was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of thy father's house. Abide thou with me, fear not, for he that seeketh my life 
seeks your life, Abiathar. He wants you dead, and he wants me dead. David is telling the priest of Abiathar. But with me, thou shalt be in safeguard. You're safe as long as you're with me, because God has got me set up for the king of Israel. I don't know if I've got time to go into this next chapter. Chapter 23. And David is, he's running for his life from the orge, from the jealousy and the rage of Saul. Because Saul thinks David is stealing his kingdom, and he's not. It's God's will. When you think somebody's stealing your position on a job because they don't deserve that, God put them there to ascend to that position. Everything's going the way God wants it to go. And God's going to protect David till he gets him to the end of the line. And David is a good, godly man. He was the friend of God. And until you get to the 11th chapter of the next book, he didn't make any mistakes. You get into 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter, David, this wonderful man of God, commits adultery and murder. You think that you're more righteous than you are? I've had people say, I can't come to Grace and Truth Ministries because there's too much unrighteousness or fighting going on there. Well, did you ever kill, did you ever get your best friend's wife pregnant and then have him killed? David did. You get to the place, you say, who can I trust? We get into that 23rd chapter. And David goes to Keilah. And he hears that the Philistines are going to attack Keilah. And David prays to God and said, Lord, shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, this is verse 2 of chapter 23. Go and I will protect you. Destroy Keilah. I'm out of time. I've got to come back to this 23rd chapter. I want you to see how men, how their orge operates. That was the orge of Saul. Anger and rage. It does nothing. It pays off in death. It eventually paid off in Saul's death. David said at one point, do I take revenge on Saul? No. I wait for God to take whatever revenge he wants to take. I'm out of time. I'll come back to chapter 23 the next time. I want you to, I want you to see this rage that's in Saul. You know, I never heard a preacher even preach on this. You've got to preach nearly the whole book to see this. Because Saul doesn't stop. I'm out to get David. Twice David has him trapped. And he doesn't kill him. I'll come back to this 23rd chapter. My next message. I, I want you to see this. It's amazing to me. What, how God uses his own revenge in his own time. God will get your enemy when he wants to, not when you want him to. I had a bunch of enemies in gospel music. They wanted to stop me because I was always telling off on them. And you know what happened to them? They've died one by one by one and I'm out here preaching and they're dead I believe a lot of them are in hell let's pray Father thank you for truth God I pray that you'll give me strength to continue this message 
strengthen the sheep and help them help them with their revenge and their orgay and let them know that it's worthless that in your time you will get the enemies of the ministry when you want to not when we want you to fight our battles that goes along with this you fight the enemy not us We'll give you praise in Christ's name. Amen. It's amazing how you can be teaching on something. You go to the Old Testament, you get the illustration of it outright. after he had committed adultery and murder and it was after he had committed that the sword would leave his house that's in in 2 Samuel you can't tell the whole story all at once it's a lot of story a lot that happens huh it's a lot that happens yep it is. Huh? I'm tired and I'm, my back's been hurting. I'm having to take it easy. 